In the name of the living God, who is blessed Trinity. Amen. One definition for the word boldness is a willingness to take risks and act innovatively, confidence or courage. You may recall that in our collect of the day just a few moments ago, we prayed and one of the things in that prayer we asked was for God's grace so that all of us, all of us that name the name of Jesus, all of us that claim to follow Jesus, <clears throat> that we would have the grace so that we might proclaim God's truth with boldness and minister God's justice with compassion. Undergirding all of that, enable to do any of that, means God's grace has to be present but we might proclaim God's truth with boldness. So one question for all of us to just let it, let it sit upon our hearts for just a few moments today is, would St. Paul's be described as a parish of boldness? Just reflect on that. Now, as we look at our Old Testament lesson, it begins and it ends with this statement. Samuel went to Ramah. Now, that pattern of doing that, of starting a story with the same, with a statement and ending it with a statement, happens uh, a bit uh, through the scriptures. And when it does, that stuff that is in the middle, that kind of acts like a parenthesis, means we really need to pay attention to what we're hearing and reading. What is happening that we need to sit with when we're told that Samuel is going to Ramah? Because in the middle of this story, we will learn a great deal about God. We learn some things about Samuel. We'll learn a few things about Jesse and even, even David. And wrapped up in all of this story, I think, is also learning and being made aware of the beginnings of the cost there is to saying yes to God. See, if we think that following Jesus should never cost us anything. I think we're mistaken. Saying yes to God is not a simple thing to do. And so this story offers us up some pictures of what that entails. So we begin with this fascinating statement that God is sorry that Saul had been made king. Other translations will use the word regret. Yeah, God regrets. It is a bit of a mystery how this all works together. The God that creates, how can God be sorry? How can God be regretful? But the story is told this way. And you may recall there is only another time in the Old Testament scriptures where that language about God is used, that God is sorry, that God regrets. And it happens in the flood narrative. That beginning with God regrets that humanity was created. That God is sorry that Saul has been made king. So Samuel is grieving this. And God is saying, Samuel, why, why are you sad? Why are you sorrowful? This is finished. Get up, and it's time to go on to the next thing. And so Samuel says yes. 
Yet he knows that this is so risky with a king like Saul that at best that we could call fickle. That you don't know what you're going to get one day to the next with Saul. Someone that is uh, paranoid. Saul may have been one of our first or early examples of someone that could be described as a conspiracy theorist. So you don't know what you're going to get with Saul. If he was in the day of technology, you might say, I don't know what Saul would tweet or email. Saul might be that kind of a guy. So it is not good for Samuel to go and participate in the working of anointing another king. And yet God says do that. So he goes, and we get more of the story that the elders of Bethlehem, they're fearful. Samuel, are you coming in peace? And he says, sure, come worship together. Let's go, let's go find Jesse. Let's pray together. And with the calf and the sacrifice, making the cover of gathering together, this work of anointing another king. And so Jesse is part of this, and he's told to line up his sons. He lines up seven of them. And here's another part, another key to the story. Because you and I would probably be a lot like Samuel, thinking that the biggest, the strongest, The best looking, he should be the king. Language that was used a lot to describe Saul. He was tall. He was strong. Obviously, that's what a leader should be. And so the first son walks up. Surely, this is the next king. God says no. The second comes up. Well, this one's got to be king. And we get that, that statement where Samuel is told, do not look. Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. You know, if the Episcopal Church, if we were of the tradition where you would say amen or hallelujah out publicly, we make a statement like this, God sees at the heart. That's the kind of statement we would say, that. oh, that's true. God sees at the heart. What exactly does that even mean? Something, though, Samuel and maybe any of us have the wrong metric. That we think it's got to be the biggest and the best. And God sees, God measures in a different way. And to such a degree that seven, seven sons of Jesse comes up and they don't even think, Jesse doesn't even think to include David. In this lineup that David in his mind is so inconsequential when it comes to who the next king should be he's not even in the lineup and so Samuel asks Jesse are you sure there's no one else well I mean there is but he's the he's the shepherd boy and we're told that he's, he's ruddy and he's handsome. Some physical descriptions, but these aren't the reasons why David is chosen. And we don't know what is in David's heart that God sees other than God sees something in David that is right and good for the moment. 
But fast forward with David, and this is not to say that uh, David did all things right, because he will have some actions in his life that could only be described as despicable. He rapes someone, murders her husband, in his own household, one son rapes his sister. And David would rather, would rather look the other way than to confront that. I mean, this is all wrapped up in who David is. And so God seeing David's heart does not mean, it can't mean that David is perfect any more than God sees any one of us. And to think that we get to follow God because we have it all together. But God says David is the one. Samuel anoints them. And lest we think that we only want the good and fancy parts of following God, the acclaim, follow it through Scripture and whatever you do, never get anointed. Uh, because it is not easy for anybody that is chosen or anointed by God. There is no celebration that David is the next king, and in fact, what he does when he leaves this now is for several years to run and hide because Saul wants to kill him. I mean, David, David says, yeah, and yes, and yet it's so costly to his life. It's going to be years before he becomes king himself. And even when he becomes king, it's not a peaceful time. But that's all through the scriptures. That those that say yes to God's call, those that boldly rise up and say, I will follow you, God, it is costly it is difficult. It is not simple. And yet, that's their witness of saying yes. Being bold, being courageous does not mean the road will be smooth. Quite often, it will be just the opposite. There will be, great time, there will be times of great trial. For St. Paul's, as old as St. Paul's is in its rich history of saying yes and trying to faithfully follow God and answer God's call here in this part of Waco has not always been easy. And what God is going to call St. Paul's to do in the future will not be simple or easy. What I think the key to be the key is what we also heard that the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David that's the key that was the key for David that's the key here and if we're going to continue to say yes come what may whatever God's call is wherever we're to go wherever we're supposed to be stretched on into the future there's no way for that to happen unless god's spirit rests on this place so saint paul's can't be it can't be about size or stature if that's how we measure ourselves we will have messed up but it's about as best we can faithfully saying yes boldly saying yes, believing that all of us together under the power of the Holy Spirit will be more, can do more than any one of us could do by ourselves. That's why we do what we do with stewardship. It's more than just yours or my money or talents. But when all of us faithfully offer up the things of our lives to God, the Spirit of God, 
stretches that in ways we could never imagine by ourselves. The Spirit of the living God is in this place. So this is not the time to play small. This is not the time to be fearful of the future and close in ourselves and do only what is predictable. But this is the time to rise up boldly, with courage, risking to act innovatively into the future and say yes to God's leading now. To be courageous, to go out into the world and share the grace that's been ours to receive. Now is the time. Come what may, regardless the cost, for all of us to rise up and say, at least in this place, under the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ will be proclaimed. That's how the world is changed. Amen.